Hello again, and welcome back to That's English. In today's documentary, we're going to meet an amazing woman called Helen Sharman. She was Britain's first astronaut. Helen's going to tell us about her journey to the Mir space station. She describes the launch of the spacecraft and the docking or landing at the space station. And she tells us what it's like to experience weightlessness or zero gravity. Most people on Earth share similar experiences. Whether we live in a big city, a small country town, or the most remote village. However, one small group of people have experienced something extraordinary that most of us can only dream about. They have travelled into space. Dr. Helen Sharman is one of these unique individuals. She was Britain's first astronaut and spent time on the International Mir Space Station. She tells us what it was like to train for her space flight. I had 18 months of training before my space flight, which is quite short, really, because we were already mission assigned, and I just had to learn about the crew operations, the spacecraft systems, what to do in an emergency, and, of course, my experiments that I was going to do in space. Um, but we had a whole range of things. First, I had to learn Russian. So three months of just language learning before then we could actually start things like really learning how to use the stars as a map in case there was an emergency in space and we actually had to steer the spacecraft like that. And the best bit is the weightless training. That's when you fly in an aircraft and it does a series of parabolic loops, reaches the top of the parabola and then the pilot just lets it fall to the ground and because you're falling inside the falling aeroplane, you know, everybody inside just feels weightless. On the 18th of May, 1991, Helen flew into space in a Soyuz spacecraft with two Soviet cosmonauts. She tells us about the launch. There's not really a countdown, not the kind of 10, 9, 8 voice that you hear so often. Um, there is a clock on the dashboard, if you like, um, on the control panel, um, and that does count down, I suppose. But really, we just go through all of the procedures, and it takes about two and a half hours. The initial takeoff felt surprisingly slow. Suddenly, there was a, a, sort of a, a sudden release into weightlessness, um, and then we just forgot what it felt like to sit down and to have weight until I returned to Earth. Two days later, Helen and her fellow cosmonauts arrived at the Mir space station. As we approached the space station, we realised that we had a problem with our automatic docking system and we couldn't rely on that. Now, if we missed the space station by a mile, we had enough fuel to go all the way round the Earth and have a second attempt at this docking. But if we missed by a small amount and crashed into the space station, then we could damage the station, damage our spacecraft, so we may not come back to Earth at all. So we had to go into manual control of the spacecraft. So I had a telescopic television camera to operate. My commander, Tolia, was in the middle and he had his rocket engines and literally, just like with these little controls, he was going up a bit, down a bit, left a bit, and we slowly manoeuvred our way towards the space station. It takes about 48 hours for the astronauts' bodies to adjust to zero gravity. After two days, people are really feeling fantastic and they can get on with their work and really start to enjoy that feeling of floating. Helen is a scientist and her job was to carry out experiments in space. I was lucky enough to do a whole range of different experiments. So I was able to grow some plants, for instance, I took up some potato roots, some wheat seedlings and some seeds, looking at how seeds germinate. What experiences helped the crew form strong bonds of friendship? Um, at the end of a working day, we would get round the biggest window we could and we would all gather round with our heads crammed together on the periphery of this circular window and just look out at the earth and talk about what we could see, about our families and friends that we'd left behind. And then, of course, if you look the other way, you can see the stars. There's no doubt that travelling in space is an extraordinary experience. Helen tells us how this affected her. When you look back on the Earth, it makes you realise how insignificant we are on this planet. You know, we're living on that very bit of the surface. Who am I? Absolutely nobody, really. All my problems, totally insignificant in this vast universe that we've got. 
What an experience! I can understand how you must feel so insignificant when you're in space. Yes, I liked Helen's description of looking back at Earth with the other astronauts at the end of the day. Um, at the end of a working day, we would get round the biggest window we could, and we would all gather round with our heads crammed together on the periphery of this circular window, and just look out at the Earth and talk about what we could see, about our families and friends that we'd left behind. And then, of course, if you look the other way, you can see the stars. Imagine if they hadn't managed to dock safely. They could have damaged the spacecraft and never returned. That's a scary thought. Lost in space forever. I think space travel is one experience I can live without. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Now it's time to discuss the value of a more earthly experience: work experience and qualifications. We asked our international friends in your country to what extent do employers value experience over qualifications? I think that in Jamaica. You will find that qualifications are actually valued more than experience, because as an island that was owned by somebody else, status becomes quite important, and proving that status becomes quite important. So having a degree and having a second degree actually is become、uh, quite key to getting on. This is a fifty-fifty question. If you're looking for a key person in an industrial area, skill is often required. If you're looking for a financial manager. They will generally look at qualifications. I think in Australia, experience is still very highly valued. Australia is proud of what they call the self-made man. That's someone who has worked very hard and discovered and done well from their experiences. I think in more academic professions, they prefer qualifications, but in a more manual job, employers would prefer experience. I would say that experience and qualifications. Matter about equally to employers when they're hiring. Although a lot more people are going to university, employers still value skills and hands-on experience a lot more. I think qualifications are quite important.、Um, there's a big emphasis on、um, going to、uh, college and receiving a, a good degree and, and going to a good college.、Um, it's it's there's quite a lot of pressure on high school students to、uh, get into that perfect school and. To be well-rounded in in sport and community activities and academically. So it seems that in some countries, such as Jamaica and the U.S., qualifications are very highly valued. But in other countries, especially Australia, employers value hands-on or direct experience. The Americans said people had to be well-rounded. In other words, developed in all aspects, not only academically. Now it's time to go back to the USA. Today, Alex is visiting the neighborhood of Harlem, the center of the African American community in New York. You'll hear the term real estate, which refers to property, especially the brownstones, which are the typical New York houses. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to New York City. Today we're going to be looking at one of the city's most influential and culturally rich neighborhoods, Harlem. Harlem is a large neighborhood in northern Manhattan. Since the jazz age of the 1920s, Harlem has become the cultural center of the African American community in New York. I'm with Carolyn, the president of Welcome to Harlem. Carolyn, can you tell me a little bit about the African American experience here in Harlem? I believe for the last 20 years, the African American experience has been really enhanced due to the fact that we're going through a second Harlem Renaissance attributed to real estate, and they're starting to really enjoy the community once again because of that. Can you explain what you mean by second Harlem Renaissance? The first Harlem Renaissance was in the 1920s and the 1930s. It was attributed to music, dance, writing, and arts and stuff like that. And then Harlem had a small downturn, and now we're roaring back. So these brownstones that people invested in many years ago in the mid 1980s for 20 and 30 thousand have gone for millions of dollars today. What makes this community so special? 
I think it's the diversity of living in Harlem. We have many ethnic groups that live here. We enjoy each other's culture, each other's food and stuff like that. And we're just one big happy family and it's just a lively neighborhood to live in. Where should I go today? Hmm, stop number one, Apollo Theater. There's no way you can make a trip here without going to the Apollo. Stop number two, I would say Strivers Road Historical District. And then stop number three, Moe's Barbershop, because that's where you get all the juicy information. I'm in the St. Nicholas Historic District. Successful African Americans moved here in the 1920s and 1930s, making the area more popular and giving it the nickname Strivers Row. This area is notable for its late 19th century urban design and a fine example of New York City architecture. Hearing gospel music perform live in Harlem is one of the best musical experiences you can have in New York City. You can hear it in many African American churches in the area. This is the First Corinthian Baptist Church. Members of the public are welcome to attend services here. Some of the best barbershops in New York City are found in Harlem. Over the years, barbershops have been a source of community and economic opportunity in black neighborhoods. I'm here at Denny Moe's Superstar Barbershop for a cut. I'm here with the legend himself, Denny Moe, here for a superstar haircut. Denny Moe, yes, how sir. long have you been here? Man, I've been here about 10 years, 10 years and counting. 10 years? 10 years. So have you seen any changes in the neighborhood since you've been here? Oh, I've seen major changes, man. When I first came here, it was, um, it was, it was like it was falling apart, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But um, it's, it's been put together pretty good now. You have people coming from all over the world to be right here in Harlem. I mean, Harlem is the place, the mecca. When I first came back to Harlem, it was a love affair. Besides cutting hair, what other purpose does your barbershop serve in the community? I mean, we are definitely embedded in the community. The, the, when you say community, you say Denny Moe. When you say Denny Moe, you say community. Yeah. That's how it is. It's synonymous, man. Because we, you know, we do back-to-school drives for the kids. You know, we give them books and book bags and, you know, send them to school with fresh haircuts. You know what I mean? And we also do scholarships to kids transitioning from high school to college. And um, we just do a lot. And uh, this is a family business, right? You got this is your... a family business. That's right. You got me, you know, the... the God, you know what I mean? <laughs> you got my son over here. His name is Denny Mo Jr. We're here. We're doing it, man. Well, you know, we're going to finish up here, but we'll see you next time in Boston. Well, Denny Mo's quite a character, isn't he? He clearly does a lot for his community. He organises back-to-school drives, which means raising money for children's books and equipment. I love the gospel music. If the services at my church were that entertaining, I'd definitely go. Well, I'm afraid it's time to say goodbye now. Bye. Goodbye.